And welcome, boys and girls. This is the Friday round one of the Insulate Tournament edition of the Three Man Weep Best Bets show, presented by Circa, the best damn sports book, period. I'm giving you lots of line lines from their book today. Um, and just really good breakdowns. If you are watching this and you did not watch the Thursday, please do so now. We have all of our takes for those regions. That's the Midwest. In the South, today we're talking the East no, first. It, it, it goes well, everywhere. It's just chronological order, Thursday and Friday. That's right. Yeah, the pods and the bracket. You know I me. Mean? I'm not quite uh, privy to how that's organized, guys. But um, but yeah, chronological order. So when you're watching games all day Thursday, all day Friday, you can watch this and sort of be your guide for what to bet, what not to bet. Uh, winners only. We'll go to Jim uh, first for some takeaways of, I guess, what's going to happen. Now we don't need to take. Let's just get into action. We got a lot of games to break, to break down. Let's just talk. How about it. all those buzzer beaters yesterday? <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> I, was I don't know. I know upsets. What my brackets busted already, man. Shoot. I thought Kai may have had an update from his rec or something, but I know that's sort of there's no. I actually users lately. Somehow I went sixteen to zero yesterday, Matt, against the spread. It, it was awesome. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Well, we'll all tell tales of our perfect betting days someday. But today we look ahead to Friday. Friday morning. I don't love that my FAU Owls are the tone setter for day two of our Vegas Marathon bashes. I, I could be in really high spirited moods or I could be down in the dumps. Um, Owls are laying two and a half against Northwestern. The gutty, gritty, lack of depthy, hurt Northwestern purple kittens, Jimbo, the pride of Evanston. Am I going to get boo booed as an Owlbacker? That's my concern. Yeah, that's that is definitely a fear. I don't like betting against him. Last year, my biggest first round bet was them against Boise State. I was just like, all right, I trust Boo Booey, I trust Adige, that defense against Boise, and it worked out great. But Matt, one of my best bets today is FAU. I just think they're yeah, there you go. Winning winning in paradise. You got the the pennant behind you as well. The, the guard play is outstanding. It can match what what Bowie's gonna throw out there. Uh, Golden should dominate the paint. I think Nicholson's going to be at best limited for this one. Uh, he is a toss up to play. I just trust FAU, Kai. It's a team that I think has been waiting for this specific moment, and now they're back in it. I, I hope they don't, you know, overthink it and and get in their own heads about trying to repeat the run of last year. <clears throat> but given the banged up nature of Northwestern, uh, I will be content riding FAU. Uh, reminder, both these coaches are terrific against the spread in the dance. Mm -hmm. Dusty 4-1 and one against the spread. Chris Collins 4-0. and oh. Yeah, uh, we, we talked about it yesterday, but Northwestern's defense, it's not the same caliber they've had in the past. I think that's that's huge. I think that one of the big reasons they've done well under Collins is they've had such great defenses in these tournaments. Uh, Babu is great. He doesn't make mistakes, neither does Northwestern. But I'm going with the cohesion the, the tournament experienced Owls in this game, they've all been here before. They all know what it takes. They have that juice behind them. Uh, they also have depth, which is nice. I, I just think they can throw so many bodies at Northwestern. So many different guys can beat you on a given night. Uh, it's an FAU lean for me at the spread. I am scared. I don't think Collins has lost a, a round one game. He's only had two, I think, in, in his career. Um, I am nervous, but FAU lean for me on the Owls. Yeah, FAU lock. I'll probably bet some FAU money line. I just the two and a half is a weird number. You'd like to get two or or three even, especially if this game does trend to a pretty low scoring affair. Most FAU games have been over easy, um, but Northwestern's been more of an under team just with the way they've evolved and adapted with some of their uh, injuries late. Also, this game is at Barclays, where the A10 tournament just took place. And I don't know if you guys watched that. That was an absolute eyesore for scoring points. So I did take the under here and because I do think it's lower scoring, that extra half point to a point around two, two and a half, three couldn't matter. But all that aside, it's FAU. This is step one of the last dance journey, and it's going to be a magical run. So hop aboard or get out of our way, I guess. Um, Matt, I, I like the over. I just want to throw that okay. out there. I think both teams are like mega efficient. Opinions. That's okay. I think I think they mega are. efficient in this game. Uh, that I am concerned about the shooting background because it was a nightmare in the A10 tournament, but. Um, I don't totally agree. Northwestern's become an under team. It's three of their last five have gone over. I don't know. It's it, they're they, it's just an efficient team. They don't they don't play a lot of defense and they can shoot the lights out. Langborg's been playing really well. All right, go ahead, move on. I just wanted to get that. Yeah, in. you're right. Yeah, the Iowa game was crazy efficient. Um, Colgate Baylor. Uh, speaking of efficient, this game should be very efficient. Um, Total is interesting here because I do think this is a fascinating pace versus efficiency handicap. 
But first on the side, again, this game's at FedEx Form in Memphis, so just just to note for the location. But uh, Baylor laying 13 and a half, Kai, 138 and a half the total. How well does Colgate attack Baylor's zones, assuming they do play some zone as they have late in the year? Uh, how do Baylor's uh, younger guards, younger studs, I should say, Misi and Walter, namely, do they, you know, rise to a bright stage against a very veteran, very sharp, but a little bit overrated Colgate team? That's kind of my yeah. premise. What's your take? I think Baylor waxes them. Um, uh, they, they've killed teams outside of the top 100 all year. No one's touched them within 13 points except for Oklahoma State. And, and Colgate, you know, I, they did compete in the non-con a bit, but still lost to Illinois by 17. I just don't think this team is nearly as good as Langle's other teams. They should have lost to Bucknell in the tournament. The records in Woodward are great, but unfortunately, they're in the front court, and Baylor it has is strong up there. The Colgate's guards are not better than Baylor's. They're less athletic. Baylor's got too much size, uh, too much dynamism in the backcourt. I, I do think maybe Colgate competes a bit on the glass here, Jim, but everywhere else, it's a big advantage for Baylor. So I took 12 and a half with Baylor. I see it's up to 13, maybe 14. I would think about them still. I think they can win this game by 20. Yeah, I like Baylor a lot. I'm debating if I'm going to bet him pre, pre-flop, as our guy Gil Alexander likes to say, or if I'm going to maybe wait for Colgate to hang around for 10 minutes, then bet live and hopefully get like minus nine and a half or something where then the athleticism starts to completely overwhelm this Colgate team. Uh, Colgate's lost once since they took Jeff Woodward out of the starting lineup and they started really going platoon system with Woodward and records. Uh, They're like sort of rocky start to Patriot play had to do with that. But uh, also that conference is terrible. And that's why they've lost once because they, they've just outclassed a very, very, very bad league. Uh, Matt, did you say you liked, you thought it was going to be efficient? Is that, is that what yeah. I caught out of you? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, I'm best betting the under. Uh, I think it's okay. going to be so low. It'll be uh, slow. Col- yeah, I think so. Really that slow. Agrees. Colgate played a 131 point game with Illinois. That's like impossible to do, considering how good that offense is and, and how willing they are to run. I think uh, Matt Lango is a terrific like game plan defensive coach. I talked to him in the offseason. It's I was like, all right, defensive scheme. Let's talk. He's like, ah, eh, our scheme is completely game to game, and we've got smart enough guys to take a game plan and actually enact it every single time out. Mm-hmm. So I think they're going to be somewhat capable of doing that. Um, and, and that sort of contributes to my hesitance to bet the uh, the spread here. But I think Baylor eventually overwhelms them. And I like the under. I think it's just uh, it's going to be like a 61 possession game. Well, well below the Ken Palm projection of 65. Good point, Shim. Real quick. Uh, Baylor's last four opening round games, they are three and one against the spread. And they've played a better team than Colgate in three of those four. The only non-cover was that Hartford non-cover in round one of their <laughs> Dominant run and in it was the really elite, elite year. It. it was close, right? Yeah, it was like 24. The spread was like 28. John Gallagher, the Hartford coach, we all crowned him as the uh, only guy who could actually cover against that dominant. So I think Scott Drew here, pretty good bet. Um, it, it, I respect Matt Langle too much to, to lay it, but I do feel like if you're liking Baylor, this is a cheapish price to lay. Um, now it's not crazy cheap. For it's in March. It's, gonna be, it's a sharp market, but I do feel like it does feel cheapish. Uh, it's getting up there, though. It's up to 14. Yeah, creeping. I had two touchdowns and above. I probably would hesitate. But uh, speaking of things I won't be hesitating on, or I haven't, I've already pulled the trigger. San Diego State UAB, this game in Spokane, up in northwest part of the country, this being in an east region doesn't make sense to me, but whatever. I'm not going to ask questions about locations. Um, (laughs) Could argue, though, the West Coast time zone will help San Diego State. The Aztecs, I don't know what else helps them, because I think this game will be close. I think UAB wins this game. Uh, they went on an absolute tour run through the American tournament. I think their talent is starting to really pop. We've seen UAB all year show flashes. They were just very inconsistent early. Uh, I, much like South Florida and some other teams that took some bad losses in the non-con. In the American, they're a lot better now than they were then. Um, I, I think this is an awesome team. They got real size up front, Jim, to defend. Ladi, who's been a beast, plus seven at Circa. Your thoughts? Uh, I love UAB. I, I initially just wasn't sure, and then I kind of was like, wait, Matt, talk me into UAB, and you did, and I agree. I, I think it's a team that is much better than their predictive ranking suggests right now, and they are playing up to that level. Gaines is a like just a terror on the ball. Uh, he's been terrific over their, their recent five-game run, like just stacking assists, not turning the ball over. 
uh, stealing, swiping it constantly. They've got size. They've got physicality. They've got some wing depth, wing scoring. Mr. Butta Johnson is smooth over there. Hey, San Diego State, Kai, they do have the physicality and athleticism, but I think both teams can have success on the offensive glass. So maybe an efficient-ish game, despite it probably being a little slowed down for San Diego State's preference. I, I think UAB wins. I'm, I'm betting the spread and oh. probably going to have a little bit of money line as well. <clears throat> yep, same. Yeah, uh, I'm going to say the stats again. San Diego State's defense, man, top 10, third straight year, top 10 in the country for the last five and top 10. Excuse me. <clears throat> Pardon me. Goodness gracious, guys. Uh, this team is experienced like FAU. They were in the title game last year. They still have a D. They still have Trammell. They still have Butler. That worries me a bit. However, I do think UAB is really solid, and they're playing two preseason, preseason expectations. A reminder, they beat Maryland at Maryland. They nearly beat Clemson. Excuse me, they're both neutral floors, Clemson and Maryland game. But competed with both teams, beat Maryland, hung with Clemson. I think they can find path to points, and that path leads towards the free throw line. I think they compete, can compete on the glass with the Aztecs. However, I'm worried about Linda Borg guarding Ladie in the post. The paint defense for UAB has not been great this season. Uh, I do like Eric Gaines. He can be the best guard in this game uh, on the floor. Uh, I, I like UAB plus seven as well. I took UAB plus seven, in fact. So I'm with you guys in lockstep with the betting. Yeah, we got Yaxel, Alejandro, we got Butta, we got Tony Tony. I mean, it's an all name team, too, for Andy Kennedy. A bunch of ca- cast of characters going to knock off uh, the Aztec. Sorry, Dutch. Doesn't Gaines have a nickname? Am I, I'm blinking. I thought he had a nickname, too. No, He's a that's the other. Worthy. That's the other. He, that's the other gains ticket. Never mind. Ticket gains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, get your gains is in order. Oh. All right. Next game: Marquette versus Western Kentucky. Two fifteen. Tyler Kolick supposed to play. We think he's going to play. Make sure to follow that throughout the week. Shaka Smart will give updates. Uh, but John Rothstein was on the beat. I saw him grilling Shaka on the uh, CBS Sports broadcast, and Shaka's like, "Well, I'll just tell you now because you don't have to text me every day until the game." Um, yeah, they like, they Tyler uh, will probably they, play. They asked Shaka or uh, Rothstein about that, and pardon my take. And he's like, "Well, look, I'm relentless. I'm not going to apologize for being relentless. Like your job, job. <laughs> CBB media watchdog that we all need." Um, Kai, I'm surprised to see Western Kentucky take some money down to 14 from the 15 point opener, especially on a 158 point total. This game should be very up and down. I love the mm-hmm. over. I think I like Marquette too. Yeah, obviously, Kolek being back is huge. West Kentucky has not played a team in the top 100 all year outside of La Tech. The schedule has done them no favors. This will be by far the best team they play. <clears throat> Excuse me. They do have talent. We talked about yesterday how much power talent West Kentucky actually has on this roster, but the fact that they play so blazing fast is a huge problem for me against elite competition. Marquette has no issue running with West Kentucky. They want to get up and down. Um, I think you can get ugly personally. The press and trapping that Marquette's going to throw at West Kentucky's ball handlers is a major problem. And I don't see Marquette having any issues scoring as well with their multiple weapons. Marquette minus 13 and a half will be a bet for me. Yeah, I, I'm considering the favor, but I think I like the over more with Matt. That's the one I have already bet. Uh, I think we get a ton of possessions here, more than it even projects. I know Marquette can slow you down with some of that kind of <clears throat> tepid pressure, like to control pace, but I, I think it makes more sense for them to pressure to get turnovers here and they're capable of doing that. Western Kentucky can cough it up, turn it over free points the other way from Marquette certainly helps the favorite. And then every time WKU takes it out, they're going to try to get up and score quickly against that Marquette defense before it gets set. So I, I thought I liked the over quite a bit, Matt. And I think you wrote it up in the, uh, the quick response file, the live file for action network. And uh, I agreed with your takes there. So I think we see plenty of points in this one. Um, I'm not sure WKU's defense can hold up enough to cover, so perhaps Kai's got the winner on the side, but I haven't quite pulled the trigger on that yet. Yeah, I, over has value here. Two more reasons, Jim. Kolick back, and he's huge, right? I think he's just more enthusiastic to push the pace with him in there. Um, look at their non con They played, like, mediocre to bad teams. Shaka just let it loose. 73 possessions against NIU, 75 against Ryder, 72 against Southern, uh, 74. One against St. Thomas, who's a slow team. Like all of their faster games in the non-con were against like this caliber of team. Not saying West Virginia yeah. is bad, but 
I just know, clicked back to last year too, and 80 against Radford, 82 against Central Michigan, 80 against LIU, 75 against Chicago State. Like they will run against they'll run. the inferior. Yeah. Yeah. And I think they're going to do that against healthy Kolick. How effective he is will have a big part of that. You don't want him jacking threes or throwing ball in the stands. I feel like he's played on one leg before and had like 30 and 10. So I, I'm not worried about that with Kolick. Um, I am worried about the Hatters, Kai, our Hatters, Stetson. One of the many proud Floridian teams in this bracket. They got to play UConn. UConn's a nice basketball team. Got a big guy named Donovan Klingon, <laughs> a couple other NBA prospects that are awesome. Debatably one of the sharpest coaching staffs in our game. They're laying 26 and a half. 26 at circa currently, 145 and a half the total at Barclays. Your take. Yeah, I'll take first to 15 in Vegas when we get out there. Stets in first to 15 because I think uh, their shooting gives them a chance at it. I think the price will be. Very high, and I love Swenson and Blackman. They're guards, fantastic guards. However, the long term of this game doesn't look good. UConn's going to score at will. Best offensive rebounding team against one of the worst in the country. Uh, uh, excuse me, 15th best offensive rebounding team. Best offense against one of the worst defenses in the country. Stetson ranks 342. Their big guy, uh, Gattaretzi, is great. He's no match for Klingon. Trayton Thompson, the backup, is not a good basketball player. He's going to get played off the floor pretty quickly. If Stetson can get hot, I think they can be a pest in the first half, but I think UConn ends up expanding it. I do have an overlean in this one here too, Jim. I think there's going to be just too much scoring for UConn. They can put up 90, 100 points. Yep, one of my this is my third best bet already. We're we're rolling in Jim best Spray bets. In the board, slate. baby. Over yes. 145 and a half, yes. Kai. I I don't see how UConn ever stops scoring in this game, and Stetson all through the second half is going to have shot makers out there. Um, the venue still spooks me. Freaking Brooklyn, man! Can we just put up a little curtain behind the the the, the basket to make a little bit better? Also, Jim, background? the A10 was played there. Like the A10 is like allergic to offense, right? We talked about how the whole Duquesne handicap and why their defense looks really good. Like, well, they played in the A10. It could also just been the A10 can't score baskets. Yeah, yeah. And look, UConn is going to score at the rim at will, so they don't need to shoot. They can just get layup after dunk after layup. If they want to hit triple digits, UConn can. It's like almost entirely up to them. Uh, and then how engaged are they defensively down the stretch? Uh, there could be a potential backdoor for Stetson, but uh, I'm not going to mess with the spread. not going to flirt with that. I'm just taking the best bet over 145 and a half. Um, into it. Let's continue next on the rundown. Uh, my Lobos. Good. I was getting excited. I was like, when are we going to talk about my Lobos? New Mexico versus Clemson. One of the popular, almost too popular because the seating is so screwed up by the committee. Um, New Mexico laying points to Clemson, Kai, the sixth seed, who I have poked holes in their resume in terms of who they beat, but when they beat those teams. Um, specifically beating Alabama early in the year, and Alabama was really struggling. Uh, beating UNC off of the Duke win, I think it's like, okay, you just got him in a classic sleepy spot. Still, very impressive <laughs> Do this wins. for everyone, man. Oh, I know. I know. Well I, well, I know you'll defend Clemson here, and, and you'll tell me why your guards have a prayer against New Mexico's speed demons in the backcourt, Kai. I think New Mexico takes care of business here, despite my concerns with some of their, you know, I, Richard Pertino in-game, questionable, for sure. Air Force, what are you doing, Richard? Don't lose that game. There's a reason why you're playing in this game right now. Um, I'm just, is it Jimmy Joe's bet? Jimmy then Joe's bet over Axis and Nose, Kai, your take. Uh, yeah, I, I will be annoyed when everyone calls us an upset and New Mexico wins. It's not an upset. They're favored. Uh, I know the 11 to six line, but you'll, you'll get the gambling hardos out there talking about it on Twitter. I'm sure. Uh, yeah. First power six opponent for New Mexico. That worries me. It, it is concerning. Uh, Clemson is no slouch. I love this team. I love this team in the preseason. I, I like all their players, but I'm going with the backcourt of Dent, Mashburn house. These three guards in March, I think are going to be really special. They don't make mistakes. That's a key. It's not like they're erratic necessarily with the ball. They, they do take care of it. They can take some bad shots for sure. But the star talent of those three, I think, is really intriguing. I do think the front court can put up a bit of a fight with Hall, with Schieflin um, for Clemson. Clemson size does bother me a bit, but the backcourt edge is with the Lobos. I do lean towards the Lobos at minus two. I'm not sure I take much past that. Like three would be dicey if it got there. Uh, the over is also a, a lean for me in this game. Yeah, I bet Clemson plus two and a half. I'm the I'm the Mr. Clemson loan all alone here. Matt says every, he sees everybody on certain games. I think I've seen everybody on New Mexico here. Not me. I'm a Tiger. I think P.J. Hall dominates the the interior. He's a great post-up scorer. 
and New Mexico's post defense numbers are not good. I know they've played Lidi and Asabor and some other really good post players out there in the Mountain West. But uh, to Kai's point, haven't seen a, a power conference team yet this year. Clemson's rim defense is also awesome. Uh, they keep you away from it. Top 60 in the country right there. And then uh, ninth in field goal percentage allowed at the rim. That's against some pretty solid ACC opponents. That's not adjusted or anything. I think New Mexico is going to have to live in the mid-range, Matt, and that can be dicey mathematically. They're going to have to hit some jumpers over the top. Clemson also takes away transition, which UAB loves to do. Uh, Brownell uh, and, and our boy Billy Donlin on that staff, Matthias. Doesn't that spook you? I know yeah, you love Donner. assistance. No, I know it does. It uh, does, for sure. It I think does. Clemson's going to be really well prepared for this game in New Mexico. I just don't trust to be at the same level. I will ride with the upset of the sixth seed over the eleven. I will concede it's concerning though that New Mexico doesn't really I don't feel great about them forcing a ton of turnovers. I don't feel great about them dominating the offensive glass, which has sort of been their contingency plans to situations when House and or Mashburn and or Den are having off nights. And that's kind of been like why they've been so good. Because when they have that going and the foundational stuff, they're hard to beat. But again, Jimmy's in Joe's bet, not an X's and O's bet, because I'm with Jim on the other team will be more prepared. The team in orange will be more prepared, I think. Um Unless Rick Patino is going to moonlight as a uh, consultant for this this scout, which would be great. Rick, please get involved. Uh, next game here, Yale versus Auburn. I think I've seen some Yale love out there. I know Auburn's the analytic darling of this field, underseeded Kai, as many bracketologists have opined so far. Um, it kind of gave me a deja vu to when Auburn and or Yale were both in the tournament a few years back. Auburn against New Mexico State, Yale against LSU. Maybe I'm reaching there for for uh, for some comparisons, but I think Auburn lays the wood here. I, I really do. I don't like that. It doesn't feel good, but I do feel like Auburn dominates this game. Uh, yep, I do too, Matthew. Um, well, yeah, second year in a row, Kim Palm, top five team as a four seed. Uh, Auburn this year, UConn last year. I do love Yale, but the two games against power competition this year, lost by 15 to Kansas and, and Gonzaga. Two really tough places to play, to Yale's credit. They just... Can't get over the hump. The athleticism discrepancy is very, very big here. They're a great rebounding team. They do handle the rock. That is two keys against Auburn, but it's Auburn. It's a different level of, of handling the ball. It's a different level of rebounding. And how will they score inside? Best two-point field goal percentage defense in the country belongs to Auburn. That's really key against this Yale team as well. And Auburn in transition, Yale's graded out as average defending it per synergy this season. I just don't see a path. Um, in general, Jim, Love Ivy teams catching double digits. That's been, I guarantee, very profitable in the NCAA tournament. I would wager very, very, very profitable. But I like Auburn here, minus 12 and a half. Ooh, I'll try to get you that info in a second, Kai, after I'm I, on it, Jim. After I I'm on it, Jim. give my... All right, we'll see if Matt's able to, to figure it out. Uh, I laid 12 and a half with Auburn. Kai, you mentioned those, those power conference games that Yale has played. I, like, Gonzaga and Kansas aren't that athletic this year especially on the wing yep. like it's McCullers like the only good wing player between the two teams there uh, up front yes they've both got dominant post scores and EK and Dickinson but those are both like ground bound lefties that just kind of beat you with positioning and touch and that's who Yale was able to hang around with this is a holy crap athleticism type of team uh, we talked about it on our on our podcast that Yale hasn't seen teams that pressure like all year haven't seen, they've seen one team in the top 75 of defensive turnover rate that was Fairfield. They crapped their pants down the stretch, blew it, and lost uh, to Fairfield. So I, I think they could get exposed against a very deep, athletic Auburn front line. I think Wolf and the uh, M Bang and Noling, those guys are going to have issues scoring at the rim against perhaps the best rim defense in the entire country. And Auburn's just kind of firing on all cylinders, playing very, very confident right now. Uh, I think they're able to get away from Yale on this one. And like I said, I laid minus 12 and a half. Matt, you got numbers? Yeah, they're 13 and 11. I'm just using the bet labs going back uh, as far back as it goes. I believe. Yeah. Really? That's it? As doubles? No, that's all games. They've only been doubles in half those, and they're actually been worse as doubles. Interesting. Six and eight, I believe. Yeah. So hey, I'm, uh, I'm data, with you. data does not match perception. That's good. I bet Auburn. So that's great. Good. I bet Yale with the opener. I thought it would come down. I did buy back with Auburn because I just feel like I looked at it a little closer and it's like, mm, I don't know if I like this. I like this. Um, final thoughts on that one. No, I, yeah, I just want to underscore. I said this before yesterday, but Yale, Yale's turnover numbers are deceiving. That's my just want to put a bow on that point. I, I do think their ball security will be exposed against Auburn. Should Auburn dial it up to level eleven 
on the pressure meter. Uh, all right, where are we here? Last one before we get to part two. Texas A&M versus Nebraska, the old 8-9 showdown, Kai. One's a pretty offense with a fun player in Tomianga that we all should be rooting for to excel and do well. And Tominaga. the other is a Tomianga. <clears throat> Tomianga. Tomianga. Not Tomianga, Tomianga. When I say Tomianga. Sorry, Tomianga. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Texas A&M, Kai, they've been better lately, but man, they've been an absolute eye bleeder to observe play basketball this season. Throw it off the glass in the rim, go get it, go chase it, turn your opponent over, win the extras, shoot more balls in your opponents. But Buzz says it every pre- <laughs> shoot more balls in your opponent, you, you have do a that. chance. Can they? Right. It's easy when you throw it off the glass and you kind of waste shots. Like, look, we got so many offensive rebounds, but we threw crap for the other. You know, whatever. Your thoughts, Kai. I think Nebraska is just too skilled in this game. Yeah, they probably have done that every game this year, but they're still like 20 and 13, whatever they are. Uh, yeah, you, you have to compare this game to Penn State last year. They, they played a good shooting team from the Big Ten, and Penn State beat them by 17. They went 13 for 22 from deep. Tobinaga is not the only guy that can shoot in Nebraska. He's fantastic. He'll be a household name. They're shooting nearly 38% in Big Ten play from three. That's fourth best in the conference, and A&M ranks... 351st in the country and three-point attempt rate allowed plays right in Nebraska's hands. Now, AM does have the biggest advantage on the offensive glass. Best in the country versus 223rd defensive rebounding rate from Nebraska. However, the Aggies can't shoot, man. They struggle to score from everywhere on the floor. The Huskers defense, I'm sure Jim will give the stat, I hope he does at least, has been very, very good lately. Uh, better than their overall numbers this year would indicate. Um, I do worry about Wade Taylor being the best guard on the floor, but I'm going Nebraska and came down a little bit. Nebraska minus one um, will be a bet for me. Yep, I bet that minus one, Kai. I'm I'm in on the Huskers. Yeah, since February 1st, they're a top five defense in the entire country. Uh, Jawan Gary being a huge, huge part of that. They just kind of make life difficult on you. I, I, I definitely have concern about the offensive glass uh, and Nebraska's away from home ranking 336th compared to Texas A&M 40th away from home per Haslametrics. That does tilt it a little bit towards Texas A&M, but the shooting thing matters a ton to me. Um, I, I think Nebraska, Matthew, gets their first program win in the NCAA tournament in history. How about that for the Huskers? Freddie Mayer, Freddie Mayer, Freddie Hoiberg, uh, resident of my building, as I've said a few times. So, yeah, I would love that. Just a fun team. Easy to root for team. Um, one of the few to come out of the Big Ten this year. I'll, I'll say that. Uh, that's all we have. Nope. Any final nope. thoughts or best? We're going to. Well, I, we I know. For, we're doing a quick left. break. <laughs> for this for this segment, is there any final takeaways, best bets? I was going to. Sorry, I was going to hope you'd stall. No, no, no best, best bets bet yet. We're end. doing best bets at the end. I'm changing the rundown. Plug Circa. Uh, all right. I guess I'll share my other region best bets at the end. Circa is the sponsor of our program. Great sports book. Thank you, Jim, for the flair. Um, Kai, have you changed the rundown yet so we can hop into part two since I have Run, nothing to... Rundown's Plug changed. Circa. Plug Circa. Plug Circa. <laughs> That's the point. Talk I just talked about Circa. Circa. I said our, our sponsor is Circa. They rock. That's all you said? Sports, you don't want to actually give them like a read? Week. Oh, my God. Um, we'll be there this weekend and next. Come hang out with us. The I mean, the premier sports viewing experience for watching games. Best sports book inside too. It's actually a nice little like terrace setup. They got the mezzanine, you got the upper balcony with the studios right there on the left. The cowboy or cowgirl thing. Just it's a great yeah. Casinos it's, it's built around venue. the sports book, whereas other places the sports book is tucked away into a little corner. I, I love that. I love that feature and setup of it. And you're in old downtown Vegas where it all began when Vegas was making its uprise to uh to glory. It's a it's a new gem in the old heart of the of the city. That's my circa ad there, Kai. Terrific. Um, Adequate. Good job. I'm ready. Let's Thank do you it. for your approval. Um hello again. We're back. Yes, Vermont versus Duke is where we enter part two of this show. Um, kind of said the same thing a few times, but but Duke, I don't love this team, but it's a good matchup for them. It's a pretty good draw, both this round and I think next round as well. I, I've watched Vermont play, I think, all three of their conference tournament games. Very well coached, as you expect, under John Becker, as they always are, but I think this is one of the least talented teams, especially offensively he's had. I think you need a little bit more um, offensive firepower to keep up with Duke here. I like Duke, Jim. Low total, low scoring. I don't think Vermont competes, though. Yeah, Duke's been pretty solid as like the opening round favorite. I mean, last year absolutely smoked a South Dakota State team that everybody had dialed up as a major darling. In or, this event. or Roberts. Or Roberts. Excuse me. Yes, I've Summit League. Uh, Max Aismas. I just remember them missing every single three and me wanting to smack my head against the table. 
Um, I actually bet the under here. That's what I like. I think both teams are going to keep this in the half court. Vermont does not want to get up, up and down. Uh, and both teams have been mega under teams all year. Kai uh, Duke is 13 and 19 on the total and Vermont is nine and 23. They've been one of the heaviest under teams in the in entire country. Top five in that. So I, I think this turns into a little bit of a slog, but Vermont struggles to score uh, especially with Stewart playing more and giving them a little bit more of a bouncy shot blocker option at the rim. No Foster likely for Duke takes away a perimeter scoring option. So under for me, 132 and a half. Uh, not a best bet, but it is one I took. Yeah, analytically another underseeded team. Blue Devils eight and Kempom, and they're a, uh, a four seed here. They did handle mid major competition with no issue this season. Uh, they didn't really play down, which I think is key in Vermont. Played one power game this year. They lost to Virginia Tech by 23. Excuse me, my nose. I don't want to sneeze. Don't sneeze, don't sneeze, don't sneeze. All right, I didn't sneeze. It's not quite the same Vermont team. You guys mentioned it. It's kind of like Colgate. While they are good again, they won the league again. Uh, they're still not the level they were uh, as past John Becker teams. They haven't shot the ball well. However, they do let it fly. And given how many threes they take, there's always that chance of variance. I do lean into the fact that they are well coached. They are smart. They are sound defensively. I kind of think they could actually give Duke a game for 20 to 30 minutes, but Duke's too 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 talented, too big, and too fast. I think they win in the end. I have a slight lean to Vermont plus 12. I, I don't think you're going to catch Vermont in tournament settings that often with as, as a 12-point dog. They are tougher than people think, I suppose, is what I'm trying to say, Matthew. Yeah, they, I mentioned they have two really good, I mean, I get more than that, but two really good athletic defenders that you're going to need to check on some of those guards for Duke. I just don't know how they defend Filipowski. Uh, I think Flip has a pretty good matchup here in this game. Um, yeah, we'll see, though. A good, fun chess match, but I think be, between two coaches that I think prefer to operate in the half court, if you ask Sean Shire, I think that's what he'd tell you as well. I like the under. I'm with Jim. I did bet that, but uh, I'm not the undertaker, so I'm not going to make it an official best bet. That would be infringing on your turf. Uh, next up, we go to a much, much, much faster High scoring affair, presumably Alabama versus Charleston. This one up in Spokane and Gonzaga country. Um, the Crimson Tide, Kyle, lay nine and a half. Some money actually on Charleston the last 24 hours. Totals at 173 and a half. Surprised that has not gone up either. I feel like. Oh, no. It went up square. five points from the opener. 168 and yeah. a half. I got it. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. That was sort of a phony opener. Whatever. Yeah, you know, 168 and a half. Did you really? Okay. I thought it was like 171 was the official. Advantage. Like, it was after totally four incorrect. Really open. Yeah. Okay. No, it was it was way off. I think it should be like 180. Uh, I'm not sure why I haven't played the 173 and a half. I feel like there might be a maybe a wrinkle or a curveball. Pat Kelsey may try and not run or play a little slower, but uh, I do think Bama against middle in competition tends to play well. As much as I am concerned with their defense, Kai, and it's not been good lately. Yeah, well, it's gonna be an awesome game to watch. Yeah, you mentioned it. High scoring, sure, it could hit 180, 75 plus possessions, 63 point attempts. It's gonna be awesome. Yeah, Charleston against top 100 opponents. Duquesne by 18, they lost. FAU by 16, they lost. They beat St. Joe's. And Bama, I agree. They torch, torch, torch middle lane competition. No offense to Charleston. Good team. You're not Alabama's level. They beat Indiana State by 22. That's kind of the blueprint here. Uh, transition teams that try to run with Alabama are going to get smacked. And transition defense for Charleston has been a problem all season. 342nd per synergy in points per possession allowed in transition. 1.15. That's killer. Bama minus nine for me, and I took the over at that horrible number as well, Jim. Yeah, I got the over at 172 and a half, Kai. Not quite as good as you, but I hope uh, I don't need that extra three and a half points of value or four points that you got. I do think there's plenty of points. It Maybe Charleston has the inclination to not run with Alabama, but that's just so outside their identity that I think it would be irregular and, and too surprising for Pat Kelsey to do that, too jarring for him. Uh, Charleston's defense has been kind of making its hay on math, like they force you to take mid-range jumpers at a very high rate. Alabama does not do that. They will not take it. They will get all the way to the rim or they will fire threes. Charleston's bottom five in the country in field goal percentage allowed at the rim that they could just get diced up there. Um, the current form for Alabama is terrible. Dead last in Haslametrics momentum statistic right now. So part of me does lean towards Charleston on the spread, despite some of their defensive issues, but much, much stronger play on the over. I'm just going to cheer for points in this game. Yeah, the more I think about the over, it's like Alabama's defense has been disastrous, and I think Charleston is very good offensively and very tough to prepare for. Like that, that's I think there's points galore on the Charleston side, and there's going to be 
points galore squared with for Alabama. Like I Charleston points galore squared. I like that. Uh, they they played in the CAA, right? Which is an off where offense generally goes to die. 30th in tempo was the where the CAA ranked in tempo this season. They got caught in a bunch of mud slide affairs, especially in the CAA tournament, right? Towson, 65 possessions, 61 for 61 to 56. Stony Brook was a slower pace game too, 70 possessions, but also in overtime. Uh, even Hofstra was kind of content to play slow. I love the over here. I think it's an absolute no doubt spinny play. Every square in the country will be on it. The Spin Kai our motto on doing. this show is spinnies win two. Spinnies, spinnies win, win two. two. They win so, two. There you go. That's the best bet for Sometimes. me. I'll lock it in right now just before we get to the end. At 173 and a half. Yeah. Right. Uh yeah. yes. I'll probably bet the first half over too. I'm just gonna let's let's get some points rolling. Yeah, let's boys. just let's cover our entire over portfolio for this game. I agree. Team total overs probably. I don't haven't looked at the derivative <laughs> stuff yet. Um, all right, now we go to Houston versus Longwood. We'll keep this short and sweet. Is there any hope for Longwood, Kai, or no? Houston Lang. Let me get the updated number here. Sorry, up to uh, 24 and a half. And a half yep, 24, Twenty-four and a half. Yeah. at circa now. Yeah. Yep, Hulk smash, uh, Longwood 2022, Tennessee lost by 32. I think it's pretty similar. Uh, this Longwood team is similar to that team, except one difference, they can't shoot. That's a problem. Uh, Houston's defensive rebounding hasn't been great, and they definitely foul a lot, but good luck scoring inside against them if you're Longwood. Also, Longwood, even if they get to the free throw line, it's not a guarantee. They're 299th in the country in free throw percentage. It's a problem. They're knocking out muscle or out physical Houston. It's going to be a wake-up call for them facing a team like Houston. I took Houston at 22. 24 at 24 and a half is starting to push it, but I do think this game could be like a 30, 40 point game when all is said and done, Jim. Yeah, I took 24 and a half smaller. I'm going to wait and or get more when the first half lines come out. Houston's just a terrific first half spread team to have been like for years and years and years under Calvin Sampson. I think there's a chance they lighten up in the second half, but uh, coming off getting blown out in the Big 12 tournament final. I think Samson will have their attention. And any any guy that's back from last year, Francis, Shed, uh, all remember almost losing to Northern Kentucky in the first round. I, I don't think there's any focus issue with Houston and a team that uh, can outcompete Longwood for those loose balls. Uh, and yeah, for reference to the getting blown out in the Big 12 game, shout out to my guy Jared Smith for this one. Teams in the NCAA tournament coming off a blowout loss of 20 plus in the conference tournament are 23 and 10 against the spread in their first game in the NCAA tournament. I think that matters like teams that have just gotten smacked and maybe their value gets a little bit mini depressed and you get a, a good focus mental effort from them. Uh, and it's Houston. So yeah, first half yeah. is going to be my preferred bet there, but also kind of like full game. It's Houston. Um, it's so many, it's funny how many people like will ask for like, Oh, Hey man, who'd you bet tonight? Like throughout the year. And every time I endorse Houston, they're always like, that was a great call, Matt. And I don't bet Houston enough, and I feel like it's just one of those things as I sit back and evaluate my betting approach long-term. Uh, adding more Houston to the portfolio is probably a good idea. Um, yeah, no first-half spreads out currently, Jim. I think this is one that you will probably see heavily shaded toward Houston, so I would it's gonna don't be like just... 16, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was. I think the fair price should be no higher than 16, 16 and a half. If you can, don't be a sucker and lay like 17 or 16, 16 and a half minus 20 minus and try and be somewhat smart about that. Uh, but Circa, our fine sponsor will not do you dirty like that. Um, if they do, they'll give you a fair juice, at least competitive juice. So hi, Wisconsin Badger ball is next up. They play James Madison. Speaking of popular, trendy upset picks, mm -hmm. pretty easy to pick the, the Dukes here because Wisconsin, they're, they don't win them by a lot. Usually, they don't lose by a lot. Usually, this game will probably be within three possessions, four possessions most of the way, especially if they play on their terms pace wise. James Madison does want to push, but they can't always push effectively against slower teams. And we've seen that against App State and some other teams in the Sun Belt. Um, I think Wisconsin wins. I kind of think it's a bad matchup for James Madison. But I'm not going to lay five and a half with Wisconsin, a team I don't like, big picture, against a team I do like in James Madison. Yeah, we have a we have a Big Ten example already. Jamie beat Sparty at Sparty. Um, unfortunately, that's the only top 100 game they've played outside of App State. They lost both games to App State. Uh, but I like their age. I like their athleticism. I like their shooting ability. Uh, three key factors in tournaments, right? Wisconsin's not an easy team to prepare for. Their 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 ball uh, their their motion offense is, is intricate. Um, it can be tough. You know, I, I no disrespect to Byington. I think he has a great coach, great staff. So maybe they have that on lock, but something to consider. 
But James Madison wins the athleticism battle top to bottom. AJ Storer is number one in the game, but JMU, I think, wins out at most every other position. What will the pace be played at? Wisconsin does not allow transition, pretty much the best team in the country in disallowing it, but they're weak when teams do get in transition, just the eighth percentile in points per possession. It's a lean for James Madison at plus five and a half for me, Jim. We'll probably end up taking a bit of it. Yeah, Wisconsin, you you mentioned the transition defense. They're also one of the worst ball screen defenses in the country by points per possession Uh, at Synergy. They gave up a ton of those possessions and uh, 311th versus ball handlers, 325th versus roll men. That's an issue because James Madison will run ball screens into the ground here. Um, you, You also said James Madison lost to Appalachian State. They are one of the best rim protecting teams in the entire country. That that includes mid majors and high majors. App State has incredible shot blockers. Uh, Wisconsin is bottom ten in the country in shot blocking rate. They don't have that like authoritative guy at the rim. James Madison top forty rim rate attacking the rim. I think they can get there out of ball screens, score consistently in the paint. Matthew, I'm taking James Madison spread and have a little bit on them to win outright as well. Love it. I probably should join you on that. I don't know why I'm so hesitant. I don't have a good reason for it, but um, we shall see. App State playing Wake Forest um, on Wednesday. Kind of want to bet App State, Jimmy. You sort of just illuminated how good that App State team was and how unfortunate it is that they are not in our field. But I digress. Let's talk Utah State versus TCU, Kai. 8-9, coin flipper. I lean toward TCU. They are laying three. Pretty big number for an 8-9 game, but uh, a Utah State has not been as good away from home, as many of the Mountain West teams have exhibited that trait all year. And do we worry about the Danny Sprinkle coach thing? I no, don't know if I... Not at all. You don't care? Okay. No, I don't care at all. I kind of do, but okay. Your thoughts on the overall Matt, matchup, though, Kai? You, you can't... Can I just say, Matt, you can't be worried about that with Sprinkle if you're not worried about with Dusty Matt. I am. I'm just not acknowledging a Dusty oh. Matt. I'm just sort of not presenting the, the argument. In the transfer portal world, selectively. I'm not concerned about that at all. No, absolutely not. I, I don't think it's a factor for any of these coaches. Um, yeah, uh... I'm TCU as well, man. Yeah, Utah State, you mentioned away from home. Um, not only have they not played a power team, we mentioned that with New Mexico, so is Utah State. Five of their six losses this year are on road or neutral floors for Utah State. So they are vulnerable uh, on, on a floor like this. I think TCU's got plenty of bigs to throw at Osibor. I love that TCU is top three in the country in experience. I think their guards are pretty solid, um, and they have really good wings. And the size and athleticism of those wings – are to me what really tipped the scale in favor of TCU. So TCU minus three, Jim, is a bet for me. One of my stronger bets, I would say. Okay. Yeah, I got uh, TCU minus two and a half. Matt, I have minus 120 on that. How about that? Mm. Uh, I, I like having that that hook. I didn't buy it. It was just the, the price that was at one of the books, and I decided I was okay with, yeah, with taking it. Um, it'll be fine. But I'll take TCU minus three as a best bet for the show. Uh, I'm okay with that. I, I think TCU is a great wager. Jamie Dixon is an awesome tournament coach. He's been uh, consistent in that regard so far. And Danny Sprinkle is 0-2 against the spread at Montana State. They got blasted both times. His two best players, arguably, in this game are guys from that Montana State team, Darius Brown and Great Asabor. And with Uday back, perhaps TCU rediscovers the form that they had early in Big 12 play when it was like, they were awesome on the road and played, you know, they won that triple overtime game at Baylor. That was the only home game that one of the top four Big 12 teams had lost for a long time. I think we see better version of TCU, even though Utah State is great at keeping you out of transition and TCU has liked to run the last couple of years. Uh, I'm going with the Horn Frogs there, Matt. Like I said, best bet minus three. Harleen Horn Frogs, nothing official. Um I, I don't know why I just can't get there. I don't like that Utah State has gone to OT twice with Fresno in the last four weeks. Um, they did not play well against Air Force. San Jose State, I guess they blew out, but then they got blown out by San Diego State. And Trent. I don't know. I, it just has, they've been a little bit, uh, they've been mortal. I'll just say that the last few weeks. Um, my final thoughts. Let's continue. St. Mary's against Grand Canyon. Fun mid-major. Nah, whatever. Mid-high hybrid major. I don't care about the designations of these teams, but a very fun coaching matchup, two elite tacticians. Uh, Randy Bennett, his resume needs no introduction, but Bryce Drew's been really good too. Um, plenty of success in the tournament, having, you know, playing up to t- higher competition as a dog. The Gales length five and a half, Kai, 131 and a half is the total. I did see some Gonzaga players lobbying for those in the Spokane area. This game's in Spokane, by the way, to rep purple and put on like a, the Havoc <laughs> North alumni type, whatever thing. So, yes, there'll be a lot of anti-St. Mary's fans at this game, I would think. 
There's gonna be a lot of St. Mary's fans though too, and and they've played also, and they've right played in Spokane <laughs> before, and I don't think yeah, I think that's advantage St. Mary's frankly, uh, and yeah, St. Mary's third straight year is a five seed. They beat Indiana by 29. They beat VCU by 12. Everybody thinks they're vulnerable in this tournament, in every tournament. They're just good. People don't realize how good the St. Mary's team is. They're overlooked every single year, and every year they just kind of put people in crockpots and and win. Um, I, Grand Canyon's great. TGF, obviously a pro. The guard play is good, but you can't beat St. Mary's in the glass. They're built for that. I don't see Grand Canyon scoring easily. On the other end, St. Mary's will kill them on the glass. They're a top three offensive rebounding rate against Grand Canyon, bottom 100, 150 rebounding rate. Um, All four of Grand Canyon's losses have come away from home. Concerning, especially when you're going to Spokane. Um, And and yeah, Jim, I I like St. Mary's here. Uh, Minus five and a half is pushing it but I'm ready to lay it with the Gales. Yeah, I've had a tough time with this game. Back and forth, uh, I think there's decent arguments for both. Uh, Randy Bennett's just so good at like every little thing you can maximize. Like, oh, let's force a lot of mid-range jumpers. Let's dominate the defensive glass, not really turn it over. Like, how do we avoid beating ourselves and making the opponent play perfect or near perfect to beat us? And it's just, it's just hard to do consistently against this team. Uh, they had some weird efforts early in the year, but they pretty much canceled all those out. They haven't had like a bad effort in, in a long time, even against Gonzaga. It was more Gonzaga just being terrific. Uh, St. Mary's defense, mega drop coverage. They want to force you to shoot in the mid-range. Grand Canyon is 27th nationally in field goal percentage from mid-range. Uh, Harrison Blackshear, who played really well in the WAC title game, and obviously TGF can score in that range. Um, I, I had a hard time here, Matt. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna not have a bet on this one yet. It's gonna be one that's gonna decide at game time. Yeah, slightly in St. Mary's. I did not pull the trigger because um, Grand Canyon size and just general defensive strength there is, is pretty impressive. It's gonna be tough for St. Mary's to I think win by margin as they have against a lot of bad teams. Part of the reason why I think St. Mary's is a little bit overrated in these. You know, what are they 20th in Kempom? They've just beaten bad teams really consistently. I so, just, you know what, under, that goes, I like the under. that goes both ways, man. Like, size doesn't I, matter. St. Mary's beats you with that, with size. Right, Indiana had Canyon, size. They lost the WCC, by 29. for the exception of Santa Clara, San, San Francisco, and Gonzaga, does not have much size. That's where I think St. Mary's punishes the, the dregs of that league consistently. Um, and yeah. Grand Canyon has size. So, also, real quick. The last two games without Josh Jefferson, I know the, the sky was falling when St. Mary's lost him. Um, Santa Clara and Gonzaga, they look, I think they're fine. Yeah. I think they'll be just fine. Um, all right. We got two more here. Uh, Purdue versus Grambling slash Montana State. What Any Grambling Montana State thoughts? Uh, I, th- I know we're all leaning Montana State pretty heavy here. No, I took are... Grambling. You took Grambling? Oh, wow. I, I took okay. Grambling plus four. I sure did. Uh, yeah. I think they're a lot tougher than people give them credit for. And they stop what Montana State wants to do. They defend the three really well. So I took Grambling in that game. I took Montana State, Maddie, minus three and a half. Uh, I did see Goraki left the Big Sky title game after a hard fall, but he seemed in great spirits on Twitter and everything. I I bet he's just fine. It's been a little while since that that Big Sky title game. Uh, I think Robert Ford will be the best player in the court. So I'm going Mm – Montana State. They had three key guys out late in that game. Uh, Walker got hurt, did not finish that game. And I think my boy Olmstead or one other was also. It was like they had no one left, but it didn't matter because Montana was just so broken spiritually because Montana State went on like that insane run. That it, but That's what they do. They did it. Like, they do. It's, it's ridiculous. A, I don't know. what It feels what team of destiny for Montana State. Um, and Matt tournament. Logie, go look. Yeah, turn, we'll see how it goes. Uh, Matt Logie is an awesome coach, by the way, as well. I, I would look up yes. what he did before coming to Montana State. One of these guys who's just been a perennial winner. Um, you know, we've seen Josh Shirts, other guys kind of blossom into stardom from out of nowhere. I think Logie is on that path very clearly. Uh, First Purdue. And then Purdue, and then Purdue wins by 50. I think Purdue kills probably, both. Kills either. Probably remember what happened yeah. last year. Um, or, Jim, as you mentioned, the nerves go the other way. And they're a little bit tight first half, and then they pull away in the second half, and we all carry on with our lives. I think they'll be tight, and if Montana State hits a couple threes early, or, or I mean, Grambling, if they're the one that's in it, uh, then you'll start to see like the real tense up. But I think they'll eventually bust out of it. Maybe Lance Jones gets a steal and a dunk or something that lights the fire and get, loosens them up, and they're like, oh, yeah, we're good at basketball. What if we just did that instead of being in our own heads? 
Yeah, Zach Heady. I'd, I'd try and utilize him, Mr. Painter. Um, by the way, Mr. Painter, been a pretty good ATS coach in the tournament. He just has a lot of loud early exits that I think skews your perception. I don't have the exact it's, numbers. It's all size. Eight, it, 18 and 13 against thank the you, Jim. In the tournament. Yep. Okay, what have you done for that. me lately is college basketball, Matthew. Uh, all right, Florida versus the winner of Colorado and Boise. I think Colorado and Boise, by far the most intriguing of the first four showdowns. We have the Buffs, who are by all accounts, a legitimate top 20 type of team when healthy, they just haven't been healthy all year. Now they are healthier now. Cody Williams, five-star freak freedom or freshman phenom freak freshman phenom say that five times fast <laughs> is back and healthy and helping the defense immensely. Mr. McKeon, they have KJ Simpson, who, as you called out is top 10 in Ken Palm player. They, they yep. have some dudes who can go. Do they have enough depth? Are they healthy enough at this point to take down a very pesky, and always tough to squash, squash Boise State team. Uh, yes, I, I, I took Colorado minus two against Boise. I think they beat them. Um, I, and I, their, their size, plenty of size, versatility to, to defend Dagan Hart and Stanley. Uh, most teams can't do that. I think Colorado absolutely can. Uh, now, Colorado, if they get past them, they play Florida, which I think most or all three of us probably expect. I think Colorado can beat Florida too. They'd be probably a slight favorite, um, especially with handlocked and out. Uh, and it, without hand locked in Florida, it, it's a question mark. Hand locked number one net rating on the team per CV analytics. He's really key offensively. They have other bigs, but he's the most important by by a fair margin. So I do think Colorado beats Boise, and I would probably be taking Colorado against Florida, Jim, if they made it there. If not, might lean Florida over Boise. Yeah, I think Florida takes care of Boise if that's the matchup. But I also think Colorado will take care of Boise. Uh, Leon Rice, 0-4 straight up, 1-3 against the spread in the uh, NCAA tournament. Has really struggled. I don't think it's a good matchup for them. I, I bet Colorado, and then I wrote this up for Action Network, and I'm going to put more on Colorado because I think it's a horrible matchup. They're uh, Boise's heavy, heavy post-ups, and Colorado is positionally gigantic. They're one of the 15 biggest teams in the country uh, at every spot, but point guard, they have people to match up with those, you know, Omar Stanley, Tyson Dagenhart, trying to find uh, size mismatches. Colorado's a perfect match to that. Uh, and even though Boise takes away the defensive glass, uh, I, or the offensive glass, I still think Colorado finds plenty of ways to score there. So I love them in that first round matchup against Florida. It's going to be pretty close to a coin flip. I'll probably go off vibes betting that game after I see the, the Wednesday night game between Colorado and Boise. Have to go against Boise. I feel bad for Leon Rice um, as they currently, as she hasn't mentioned, been tough to go against them. It's been easy. It's been free money. Um, <laughs> the number, the t no team has gone. Oh, and nine or how it's like, no team has as many NCAA tournament game appearances without a win. Boise is the current record holder in that regard. So tough. Um, they deserve better, but it goes to 0 and 10. I think I agree with you. Final best bet recap. I gave away one during the show. I think Jim and Kai mentioned a few. I'm trying to iron out my final selection. Kai, would you like to present your best bets? Sure. Uh, I did two on Thursday. I'll, I'll, I'll do two again here, I suppose. Um, I can't read my writing. Um, one's going to be Baylor against Colgate. I know it's going to be kind of high, so 13 and a half, yeah. We'll go with Baylor. Um, and then we'll also go with, hmm, t -t 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 I know Jim probably going to overlap with you a bit, but that's okay. Uh, UAB plus seven will be my other best bet. It's okay if we overlap a bit. Yeah, no, I actually did not take that as one of my best bets, but I do have four. FAU minus two and a half. Baylor Colgate under 138 and a half. Stetson UConn over 145 and a half. And TCU minus three. That is my four pack for Friday. Matthias, round us out. Uh, I gave away the Charleston Bama over. Spinning special of the day for me. And then, yeah, my true best bet of the entire first round is UAB. So I will double up with Kai because I just want to be genuine. Um, and FAU will for sure win too. So make sure you bet that. But I won't add that to my list. FAU money line. To Joe's point in the chat, I did bet TCU as well. Um, so there's another bet, I suppose. Fellas, that does it. Kind of a uh, here it is. Um, and now we just kind of sit back and wait and watch and see what happens. And hopefully all of our locks come through and we look prophetic and like geniuses as opposed to dumb idiots wearing spinny hats on a Tuesday morning at 11 a.m. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Circa, for making this all possible. 
the best damn sports book period sees up. Hopefully we see many of you watching, listening, contributing in the desert this weekend or next when the live shows begin at Circa. That'll be fun too. But until then, uh, good luck on your wagers and may the three-point variance be ever in your favor.